as, long as, it's, as long as it's a long gun, so, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And that's yeah. because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now, that can't be right, can yeah. it? Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Daisy McAndrew. And I'm Nick Wallace, sitting in for Vanessa Feltz. Coming up on the programme, Labour in crisis. Sir Keir Starmer hunts for more attendees of the now infamous Rochdale local community meeting after two would-be MPs are suspended over attacks on Israel. Plus, inflation unexpectedly holds at 4%, but mortgage misery and some price rises continue as the cost of living continues to bite. We'll have all the details. And mega deal. The Duchess of Sussex will return to podcasting after signing a dynamic contract with the female-founded company Lemonada Media. OK, well, plenty to come over the next couple of hours, but first off, let's get the news headlines with Alex Barker. Good afternoon. The Bank of England's chief, Andrew Bailey, says he's encouraged by the latest inflation data, which showed the rate stayed level at 4% in January. The Office for National Statistics says rising energy prices were offset by food prices, which fell for the first month in over two years. It could be good news for mortgage holders, as interest rates are also expected to come down. The Prime Minister told business leaders that the economy has turned a corner. Inflation has been more than half, from 11% down to 4%. Mortgage rates are starting to come down. Everyone is predicting us to grow this year. Our debt is on track to call, providing that security in our public finances. And because of all of that, we've been able to start cutting taxes. Well, former Bank of England economist Carsten Young told Talk TV that the government can't take the credit for inflation stabilising, though. We're expecting inflation to be back down to target uh, probably by the middle of this year. So, um, you know, this is definitely good news, but uh, Jeremy Hunt and the government um, don't really uh, have much to do with it. Sir Keir Starmer is under pressure to suspend councillors who failed to call out anti-Semitic remarks made at an event in Rochdale. It comes after a second Labour parliamentary candidate, Graham Jones, was suspended for allegedly saying that UK citizens who volunteer to fight for Israel should be locked up. Labour had already withdrawn support for Azhar Ali in the Rochdale by-election over his alleged controversial remarks. The party says it's committed to rooting out anti-Semitism, but Stephen Silverman from the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism told Talk TV it's inconceivable that prejudice has been eradicated from the party. How do you go about eradicating it? Well, you can only do it when you become aware of things that people do and say. Um, it stands to reason that there must still be a lot of people within the party at number, all levels who still hold the views that were problematic. They just haven't expressed them. Train drivers have announced fresh strikes in March. Members of the union ASLEF, who work at the LNER and Northern Railway companies, will walk out on Friday the 1st of March over pay and conditions. There will also be an overtime ban from the 29th of February to the 2nd of March. The union says it's fed up with the slow progress of negotiations with rail bosses. A faulty egg freezing product could have affected more than 100 women who had the procedure to preserve their chances of having children. The fertility regulator says two centres, one at Guy's Hospital in London and Jessup Fertility in Sheffield, could have used the product, meaning the eggs might not be usable. The centres say they have contacted all the patients affected. Ukrainian forces have reportedly destroyed a Russian warship off the coast of Crimea. Ukrainian defence officials have released this footage, which they say shows the Russian ship being attacked by naval drones, though there's been no confirmation that the vessel has actually been sunk. Meanwhile, Canada has promised another $44 million to support Ukraine in the war. And there was a familiar face on show as Queen Camilla toured some art studios in West London. She admired a portrait of Princess Charlotte. That's the one with the pink background. Meanwhile, her husband, King Charles, is at Sandringham after spending a day in London thought to be for more cancer treatment following the announcement of his diagnosis last week. 
That's the latest. Time for a look at the weather next with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. A lot of wet weather about for this afternoon across the vast majority of the UK. We've seen spells of rain coming in from the southwest, moving northeastwards across much of England, Wales, Ireland and Northern Ireland into central and southern parts of Scotland now as well. Northern Scotland just about staying fine and dry for the mainland, but Shetland and Orkney seeing showery spells of rain as well. There's a few breaks in the cloud though for this afternoon for parts of the East Midlands, central and eastern England, and that will boost the temperatures with the mild airflow as well. So we're looking at highs locally of up to 15 degrees Celsius, above average for the time of year. Still cold across Scotland there, around 7 or 8 degrees Celsius, but that's around average. Now, overnight, we'll continue to see outbreaks of rain moving northwards across much of the UK. As you can see, some heavy downpours indicated by the brighter colours there across parts of Wales, northern England, southern Scotland, into northern Ireland for a time too. It will be a very mild night, though. Temperatures, in fact, not really changing from the daytime highs, lows of around 7 to 11 degrees Celsius. And then through tomorrow, most of the rain will be up towards northern and western parts of the UK. So actually plenty of fine and dry weather for most of the East Midlands, central, southern and eastern England. And Again, another very mild day for many places. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Well, many thanks to Alex and to Nazanin. Time to move on to our top story, which is that Sir Keir Starmer has found himself still at the centre of another anti-Semitism storm after Labour was forced to suspend another would-be MP just 24 hours after it ditched its candidate in the Rochdale by-election. Graham Jones, the prospective Labour MP for Hindburn, was recorded making anti-Israel comments at the same local party meeting as Azhar Ali. Israel again, you know, and I'm sure that all these people think that when they go on, but you will not get Israel over the line unless we go at them hard. The uncovered recording has sparked questions about who else attended the meeting and why it was that both Graham Jones and Azza Ali were not challenged in what they said at the time. And the fallout from the meeting has seen pressure build on Sir Keir, who promised to tear out anti-Semitism by its roots when he took over the Labour Party in 2020. Well, joining us now in the studio is Talk TV's chief political commentator, Peter Cardwell, and down the line, we're joined by former Labour official, Richard Power Said, and the former Labour MP, Sean Woodward. A very good afternoon to you all. Hi. Peter, let's start with you, first of all. Um, I was starting to think this is feeling like day three of a scandal. How much can you actually get out of this, this recorded meeting that took place? But it is starting to look very serious in the polls, potentially, for the Labour Party. Yes, the polls have tightened. Now, that may well have been to do with the 28 billion U turn previously on the environmental links, but certainly this is harming the Labour Party. And it looks not just as if anti Semitism is still within the Labour Party, which is what Keir Starmer, to give full credit to him, has spent four years trying to eradicate uh, from the anti Semitism that flourished under Jeremy Corbyn. But actually, there are more and more details dripping out about this. As you said in your introduction, why did people not stand up and say something about this? There are other leaders that are reported to have been there, local council leaders and so on. Who was at this meeting? Why were they saying these things? And why was what uh, bo both candidates saying tolerated? So, yes, it also looks in terms of political judgment as well, because originally people were sent out, shadow cabinet members like Pat McFadden, who's coordinating the whole election, and Lisa Nandy to support Azhar Ali. But now, with more and more people involved with this, heavily embarrassing for the Labour Party, especially as both uh, as two constituencies, Kingswood and Wellingborough, go to the polls tomorrow. Yeah, but I'd be putting aside the, the delay in, in dropping Azhar Ali. We know that elements of the left within the Labour Party have a problem with Israel. We know that anti-Semitism has been a big issue on the left for many, many years. Why has is, why is this blown up now? I think it's blown up now because there's a recording. I think it's blown up now because it's su such terrible anti-Semitism, the conspiracy theories that are being put forward, but also because there are three by-elections at the moment, and Azhar Ali is a candidate in one of them, in Rochdale. And he is someone who has been selected by Keir Starmer's Labour Party by apparently very tight 
uh, procedures to actually be the candidate. So if you are someone who says, I have eradicated or attempted to eradicate or done lots of work to eradicate anti-Semitism within the Labour Party, which I think Keir Starmer, in fairness to him, actually has, well, then you say, well, how did this guy get selected for the by-election? That was only a couple of weeks ago that he was actually selected as the candidate. You also have the fact that there was a meeting full of Labour activists where people were saying and, and supporting very anti-Semitic tropes, conspiracy theories and anti-Israel comments. So that's a real dilemma for uh, Keir Starmer. No one's saying that anti-Israel sentiment and anti-Semitism is eradicated from the Labour Party, but clearly you have a situation where this recording has come to light from wherever it's come from, it doesn't really matter. Maybe it's a political opponent, maybe it's some disgruntled person within Labour. In a sense, it doesn't matter. But we have this row coming up again and really dominating the news agenda. And whilst the Conservatives are saying bits and pieces about this, really all they have to do is sit back and see the news agenda rumble on and the problems continue and indeed escalate for Keir Starmer. Yeah. Let's go to Sean Woodward. Um, Sean Woodward, you've been involved in, in plenty of elections, by-elections and general elections over the years. And you know that to get those foot soldiers out, banging on doors, posting leaflets, they need to believe in the leader, they need to believe in the chances um, of election. Now, of course, Labour supporters and party members do have belief at the moment because they've been looking at the polls and they put their trust in Keir Starmer as somebody who could take the Labour Party away from the days of Jeremy Corbyn and lead them to number 10. There are going to be quite a lot of wobbles going on within the party at the moment. Well, you're not wrong, Vanessa. And at the same time, I don't think Keir Starmer is wrong to be gripping this in the way that he's doing it. But that doesn't in any way take away from the fact that something very clearly has gone wrong in Rochdale and something very clearly went wrong in that seemingly dreadful meeting in which people said things for which they rightly should be called out for and the party should exert the strongest discipline so that the message that Keir has been promulgating for the last four years, which is that he will not tolerate anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, is absolutely at the center of our policies and at the center of the values of our candidates. And if somebody has managed, maybe a little bit like that man who managed to get on a British Airways plane without a passport and get through security and fly to New York, if he's actually managed to get through the process and selected without being spotted, then uh, David Evans, the General Secretary, has got some work to do to sort out how on earth that happened. But it doesn't take away from the fact that right now Kia is gripping this some people may not like it, but I think he's absolutely right to. Anti-Semitism has no place in the Labour Party. It was allowed under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, and it has to be expunged from the Labour Party wherever it is found. But, but, but Sean Woodward, just picking you up on that point, it's not as if this candidate, Azar Ali, was a complete unknown, and in fact, it's quite the reverse. When he first got into hot water at the beginning of this week, there were plenty of prominent Labour voices that were coming out to support Azar Ali. He was a very well-known person. In fact, we're led to believe that he's pretty chummy with Keir Starmer himself, so it's not the fact that he slipped through the net you know, in the search for candidates. He's been around a long time. He knows a lot of uh, the big cheeses in the Labour Party. No. They all thought he was a jolly good fellow. Well, I'm not in any way condoning what he said, and I'm not in any way excusing what he has done. If people at the beginning of the week gave him the benefit of the doubt, right now it's very clear that there is no doubt at all. He said these things, and he didn't just say them once, and there is no place for him as the Labour Party candidate in this by-election. And so Keir was absolutely right to do this. But look, this is what leadership is about. It's, it's not actually that somehow there's going to be a magic formula that gets rid of all your problems and you don't have them anymore. It's that when problems do appear or do reappear, how do you deal with them? And I think one of the things the country can see now is how Rishi Sunak is trying to grip his party and failing inside the Conservative Party, with Liz Truss and others forming a splinter party within the party. And you see Keir Starmer here saying, look, I gave this guy the benefit of the doubt when I were told he said one thing wrong, but this is a pattern. You know what? There's no room for this in the Labour Party. I, he has to go. And I think Keir was right to do that. Richard, let's put aside the conspiracy theory element to what Azar Ali said and, and his the, the whiff of anti-Semitism that hangs around his comments about powerful figures in the media. Is it not understandable and perhaps encouraged within certain parts of the Labour Party to be sharply critical 
of Israel. Was, was not some of the sentiments expressed in that meeting simply critical, critical of Israel rather than being anti-Semitic? I mean, do you think it's OK for people in Labour to loathe what Israel is up to? No, it's not OK to loathe Sorry, this was Israel. a question. Um, Sorry, Sean. I do beg your pardon. Not, this was a question okay for Richard. to loathe Palestinians either. Sorry, Sean. Sorry, Sean. This was a question for Richard. Just to slightly correct uh, what you said there, Nick, I, I, th I don't think it was a, a whiff of anti-Semitism about that point um, that uh, that was made about um, uh, people in the media. I think he literally referred to it was something. The phrase was something like certain Jewish persons in the media. So, I mean, I I think we can all agree that that's sort of out and out anti-Semitism. Um, your question, you know, about being really critical of of Israel. Um, I think we all know that there is a difference between being very critical of the decisions made by the Israeli government um, and being anti-Semitic. I mean, a lot of Jews in this country, indeed a lot of Jews in Israel, are extremely critical of the current administration uh, in Israel. So I, I think we can all tell that that there is a big difference between those things. It's very clear to me that what happened in that appalling meeting went way over the line. So what needs to be done about it? Because we're hearing that there are queries being raised about how many people were at the meeting, why no one stood up and said anything, whether those people should be disciplined because they didn't, they didn't shout Azarali down in, in what he was saying. I mean, where, where, where does this go and, and to what eventual effect do you think it will have? So I guess there's, there's kind of two things here, right? There's our moral judgments, our, our criticisms of people failing to, um, you know, to, to criticise uh, people who are putting out conspiracies, that kind of thing. There's our moral criticisms, and then there's, like, the kind of legalistic punishment of the uh, Labour Party um, uh, uh, rule system and punishment system. And the thing that I think we need to bear in mind here is that in the UK, um, it's not there's, it's not legal to not report a crime. There's no, more, there's no legal obligation to report a crime. And I think it would be a pretty strange situation if we treated breaking the rules of the Labour Party as more serious than breaking the laws of the land. So should people be criticised for failing to call it out? Yes, but should we bear in mind that different people will have different reasons for that? Some of them may be, have been felt intimidated, for instance, by a very senior person in their local party saying something. Like There are all sorts of reasons why people might have failed to do that. We might criticise them for it, but kicking them out of the party is a very different thing. Richard, I'd love to get your view on what Sean Woodward was saying a minute ago about, you know, that, that Keir Starmer had acted pretty fast, is being pretty ruthless, is doing what's necessary, when, of course, there are plenty of people saying, actually, he took far too long, he waited for, you know, the second... the, the, the newspapers and the recording second bite of the cherry, that he was rather naive in thinking that that was going to be the end of it, that he could say, oh, the poor chap's made a mistake, he's made a fulsome apology, that's the end of it. Where do you think that the party faithful um, will be at the moment as they look at Keir Starmer? Will they think, you know, this is the decisive leader we need and deserve, or will they be thinking, actually, maybe the government's got a point, maybe Keir Starmer is a flip-flopper and isn't decisive enough? No, I don't think there's, there's any chance of that. I think that, uh, I mean, look, I, I think about my own experience when I used to work at Labour Party HQ, because I totally get why people wanted faster action. I did too on, on, on this decision. And I think that we all agree now that it was the wrong decision to keep Adar Ali on, to keep on backing him as the candidate. Um, and I think Keir Starmer's always been really clear that his primary responsibility is to our Jewish communities and to reassuring them about the Labour Party because we really failed them previously. But there is a tension, a kind of fundamental tension, and this is true in the law and it's true in the Labour Party, between being fair to people when you think they've broken your rules and being really quick in administering justice. Those things are always going to be a little bit contradictory and balancing them out is really tough. And yeah, like I say, I think about when I was uh, at HQ, you get somebody really apologising as soon as they've been caught out. Maybe they've got what sounds like quite a decent explanation. You know, my understanding is that 
people interpreted what Azar Ali said as um, he was maybe trying to persuade people who were at that meeting not to uh, not to leave the party. And so he sort of tried to bridge the gap by saying these conspiracy theories. Look, it doesn't sound to me like that was the case, but you can understand why if somebody if you're trying to adjudicate this, you're at Labour HQ, you get given what sounds like maybe it's a decent explanation, you've at least got to listen to that, you've got to give it a yeah. fair hearing. And I think, to be honest, that is what people want from a leader of the Labour Party, from a Prime Minister, somebody who's going to give people a fair hearing, but ultimately make the right decision in whether to punish someone or not. Um, Sean, we've got to go very shortly, so a very short answer, if you wouldn't mind. Um, there will be many people who will just think, well, this is what certain factions within the Labour Party will say when their guard is down, and so it's no surprise to them. How are Labour going to change the dial on this to persuade the country that they're not ribbon with people who, when they think no-one is listening, can start spouting uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories? I don't think it's about changing style. I think Keir has made his position very clear, and that's the position that's going to prevail. The benefit of the doubt that Richard referred to was given to this candidate. Um, we now realise that that benefit of the doubt, unfortunately, he was the wrong person because his values are not the Labour Party's values under Keir Starmer. And those people who don't share those values I think it's going to be very difficult for them to want to stay in the Labour Party. So I think what's at the heart of this, though, and this is a very important thing, this is not about being anti-Jewish, anti-Israel, anti-Palestinian. This is about the values of a leader, the man who I hope will be our prime minister, in which hate has no part in the values of government and the tolerance of hate and the tolerance of prejudice has no part in the place of a future Labour government. And I think where Richard and I would be absolutely united on here is it may have taken a few days to get to the right place, but the right place is the one that Keir believed in last week, and it's the right place in terms of the values of the Labour Party at the next election. Okay, sure. Anti-Semitism has no place in the Labour Party or in a Labour government. OK, Sean Woodward, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and also you. thank you to um, Richard Paris. So I um, just wanted to bring Peter Cardwell back in. Obviously, one of the um, bits of the jigsaw puzzle that Keir Starmer was putting together to create the government in waiting and the really professional, decisive party was to bring in Sue Gray, that rather controversial figure who came from the civil service. She's been in the press this week uh, as well and perhaps not getting uh, the sort of the, the glowing reports that she was hoping for. Yes, indeed. This is around the 28 billion uh, green deal and the there was a small-ish meeting and something leaked out of that and there's been a leak inquiry in the Times this morning, Gabriel Pogland and Patrick McGuire reporting on this, saying that apparently people were left in tears by their treatment, uh, phones were seized and people were asked about who they'd been emailing and who had been leaking. Now, I used to work in government. I was part of a leak inquiry once. I wasn't the person leaking. But then again, I would say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> and certainly, my, phone's, my phone was taken. It was going through. My emails Different were going now through. Now you're on the other side of the fence. Happened. Yeah. <laughs> but interestingly, uh, the, uh, apparently, there's complaints that union officials weren't, uh, weren't aware and weren't brought into some of those meetings and so on. So Sue Gray uh, is someone I work with. She's someone who has a very robust style and uh, she's very professional, uh, mostly. Uh, certainly, although she's obviously been criticised for this. But she is there to do Keir Starmer's bidding and no one is going to get in the way of that. Yeah, I mean, it sounds from the way you're describing it, Peter, like actually it was a bit of a wake-up call to those Labour Party members who don't really know what life in government is going to be yeah. like and that maybe she was deliberately putting the wind up them um, and you know, being the tough cookie that we know she is to try and say, you know, if you think this is bad, giving me your phone yeah. and answering some tough questions, wait until if and when you're on the other side of the well, fence. Well, absolutely, Dizzy. Let's put those two challenges together, the, the leaking and what Keir Starmer's been put through. I mean, government is really difficult. You've got to make yep. very, very difficult decisions all the time, whether you're the Prime Minister, someone in uh, number 10 as an advisor or, or whatever. And there are really tough, you know, 50, 49, 51 decisions that need to be made every single day. And this is perhaps a taste both for Keir Starmer and for some staffers at, at Labour HQ of what might be ahead. Yes, well, very interesting yeah, to see to see how who who sinks and who swims in the world of Sue Gray. Peter Caldwell, uh, thank you very much for explaining that bit of the puzzle to us. Uh, now, a reminder to you that the candidates for third day in a row, Daisy. Come on, let's do it. Election. Are you ready? Here they are: Azza 
Uh, Ali, as we know, officially Labour Party candidate, but not so much in truth. Mark Coleman, independent. Simon Danchak, Reform UK. Ian Donson, Lib Dem. Paul Ellison, Tory. George Galloway, Workers Party of Britain. Michael Howarth, independent. William Howarth, another independent. Guy Otten, Green. Ravin, Rodent, Subortner, official monster raving loony party. And finally, another independent, David Tully. All right. Brilliantly well. done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Coming up after the break, now the rate of inflation has remained at 4%, despite forecasters predicting a rise. But what does that mean for the money in your pocket? My name is Nick Wallace. This is Daisy McAndrew, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. <laughs> King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and banged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, is it? It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. What are you well, going okay. up for? This is Plank of the Week, <laughs> Will. <laughs> Bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is, Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it Unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, <laughs> in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's, no, a, as, long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And yeah. that's because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now, that can't be right, can yeah. it? Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Sunak says the economy has turned the corner after inflation held steady at 4% in January. Experts had expected inflation to rise due to higher energy bills, but a fall in food prices for the first time in two and a half years helped offset the costs. There are now hopes that the Bank of England could start cutting interest rates earlier than expected. Labour, however, says millions of families are struggling and prices are still rising. Joining us now is Victoria Scholar, Head of Investment at Interactive Investor. Hi there, Victoria. Um, with interest rates slowing, that still doesn't mean that prices are coming down. It just means they're going up more slowly than before. And we know how much people are struggling at the moment. 
Yeah, that's right. The inflation rate looks at how much prices have changed over the last 12 months. But the cumulative inflation that we've seen since COVID has been much more dramatic. So uh, even as the inflation rate comes down, uh, families and individuals are still grappling with price pressures, whether that's in the supermarkets, filling up their tank with petrol uh, or paying rental costs. So inflation is still a problem, which is why interest rates have gone up a lot since December of 2021. And the Bank of England's in wait and see mode to decide hmm. when it can actually start cutting interest it's rates. Still, it's still double the 2% target, isn't it? So do you believe Rishi Sunak when he says the economy's turned the corner? It's difficult. The last mile of getting inflation back down to that 2% target is going to be the most challenging. To put it into context, you know, inflation has come down a lot. In October of 2022, it was at a 40-year high of 11.1%. We've been seeing it slowly, slowly ease. Uh, but for many at home, they won't be feeling that. They'll still be feeling the effects of those price increases because prices are a lot, lot higher than where they were uh, around the time of the pandemic, before the war in Ukraine that sent commodity prices sharply higher, before we had issues with food imports and poor harvests overseas, uh, and other factors that have led to volatile, volatile prices around the world. Well, exactly that, Victoria, because in fact, just this time yesterday, Nick and I were sitting here talking to an expert about the fact that there's going to be a tea shortage. And of course, the reason for that is because <laughs> of the Red Sea, because of the Houthi attacks on those shipping containers. Now, of course, the knock on of things like that, and we know it's not just tea, that's the busiest shipping lane uh, pretty much in the world. Those ships will then have to go all around the Cape of Good Hope, around South Africa. So the products on those ships will be more expensive. So we've still got all these other headwinds that presumably are going to keep trying to push prices and inflation up. Yeah, and I think that is one of the big unknowns when it comes to what happens to inflation in the months ahead. We've had many businesses already warn about the potential impact of the Red Sea uh, attacks. Companies like IKEA and Tesco have talked about potential product shortages, potential delays, and even the possibility of price increases too. So that's why I think that the Bank of England is holding fire from cutting rates right now, even though, of course, that would give a boost to the economy and markets at a time when uh, they need it. Uh, but it's certainly doesn't want to start cutting rates too early and then fueling inflation unnecessarily. And of course, today's figures weren't the um, only uh, economic indicators that will have been in the Chancellor and Prime Minister's diary uh, this week. We know we're going to get figures on how GDP is looking, how the economy as a general is looking, UK PLC. What are you expecting from that? Well, it's going to be interesting to see whether we fell into a technical recession at the end of last year. But uh, really, it doesn't matter that much whether we get a figure that's just above zero or just below zero. It's more about how people are feeling. And I think it's the pressures from inflation, from higher interest rates and the broader cost of living crisis that makes a lot of people feel as though we're in a recession, whether or not we have actually reached that technical hurdle. Just out of interest, Victoria, what is it that has brought the interest rates down? Is it the cheaper fuel prices coming through into the commodities? So interest rates haven't come down yet, but inflation sorry, has sorry, stuck at 4%. Sorry, sorry, forgive me, inflation rates. Sorry, there you go. Saw... <laughs> so the, yeah, so the inflation rate, we've seen upward contributions from higher gas and electricity charges, but those were actually offset by downward contributions from furniture and household goods and food and non-alcoholic drinks. So this time last year, uh, energy prices were lower because of the energy price cap. Uh, now that that's uh, come off, we've had to see uh, a lot of energy prices increase. Uh, but then in terms of a lot of uh, retail items, uh, we're in a pretty tough month. Jan we, we're talking about a tough month, January, after the festive uh, cheer has ended, and that's when sales come in. So a lot of businesses are cutting their prices. Uh, also in the supermarkets, they've been uh, taking part in this fierce price war, competing with the likes of Aldi and Lidl, uh, which are notoriously competitive on price. So we've been seeing supermarkets have to cut prices on essential items. Uh, so in terms of January's figures, there's been some upward contributions as well as some downward contributions that net net have essentially led to no change which is why the inflation rate remained at four percent in line with what we saw in the previous month and victoria many economists um who 
one speaks to will say actually the only thing that really matters, which is an indicator of whether you know, as a nation, as an economy, we're going to get ourselves out of doom and gloom and a slump, is confidence. And of course, that is something that's very, very difficult to measure. But either consumer confidence, or do people feel that things are getting better? Are they going to you know, book a builder to do a new kitchen extension? Might they take a, you know, a new mm. hire um, lease out or on a car? All these things that will put some money into the economy. Uh, are businesses confident? Do they feel that you know, they're ready to buy a new piece of kit, a new piece of, of technology that mm. might, therefore, you know, that, that investment might lead uh, to, to bigger sales in the future? Can you give us any indication of how confidence is looking? Yeah, and I, I totally agree with you that a lot of it is about sentiment and confidence and how people are feeling, whether they're going to go out there and spend on those big ticket items or businesses are going to go and invest in more projects and hire more staff. Uh, now, I think one big potential tailwind to confidence is going to be the fact that uh, economists and analysts are all expecting that the Bank of England is going to cut rates at some point this year. And of course, uh, cheaper borrowing is extremely positive for businesses and consumers can help fuel activity in the housing market. It can help fuel all sorts of other business activity as well. Uh, so I think the fact that this is on the horizon is helping to drive a pickup in confidence this year, because there's no doubt we've been in a period of low confidence uh, since the pandemic, and then the war in Ukraine, then the tensions in the Middle East. Uh, it's been a really tumultuous time, uh, but it does feel as though this lifeline around the corner of potential easing in borrowing rates is helping to drive a slight pickup in business and consumer confidence. That's really interesting stuff, Victoria. Thank you very much indeed. Victoria Scholar there from Interactive Investor. Coming up after the break, heartbreak for more than 100 women after a freezing error damages eggs and embryos at a fertility clinic. I'm Daisy McAndrew, this is Nick Wallace, and we're sitting in for Vanessa Feltz this week. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well. Would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. <laughs> King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and bagged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you have to look at someone. What are you well, doing okay. that for? This is Plank of the Week, <laughs> Will. <laughs> Bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is, Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the new conservatives, the ERG, the common sense research group, the red wall, red trouser, popcorn. I mean, popcorn, what, what is that?
And with the gun culture, <laughs> in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, I mean, it's, a, as, long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And that's yeah. because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now, that can't be right, can yeah. it? Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Hello and welcome back. Now, more than 100 women who had their eggs and embryos frozen at a leading fertility clinic have been told they might have been damaged due to a fault in the freezing process. The clinic at Guy's Hospital in London says it may inadvertently have used some bottles of a faulty freezing solution in September and October 2022 without knowing that the liquid was defective at the time. It's a terrible story, this. It's believed that many of the 136 patients affected have subsequently had cancer treatment, which may have left them unable to conceive naturally. Guy's Hospital has now contacted all those affected and apologised and the fertility regulator is investigating. Joining us now are the barrister Paula Roan Adrian and GP Dr. Philippa Kay. Uh, Dr. Kay, first of all, I mean, this is just heartbreaking. One thing that none of us can understand is why it took so long for Guy's Hospital to contact the people who were affected and say that they think they may have lost their embryos. Absolutely. So first of all, this is a really, really heartbreaking story. Um, and that people will choose to freeze eggs or freeze embryos for lots of reasons to preserve their fertility. Um, for example, let's say they feel that they're not ready to have a child, but they would like to in the future. But actually for lots of women, they do it before treatment for cancer. And it may be that their cancer treatment, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, then puts them into an early menopause, which of course then impacts their ability to um, get pregnant naturally afterwards. And the real concern um, that we have here when it comes to medicine, if a mistake is made, you own up to it and you talk about it early, as soon as you know. And the fact that it took so long to me is even more concerning. Yeah, because the treatment was uh, in autumn 22. That's the, 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 the time where they think the, the uh, fluid batch was used. The drug company alerted we understand the NHS in February 2023, but this was not communicated to the patients. And of course, the fear is that many of the uh, people who donated their eggs may have then gone on to have a treatment which they could have not had if they thought there was an opportunity to freeze some more of their eggs or go through that procedure once more. And, and so there are people who may be looking at this window of opportunity that was slammed shut on them because they just didn't have the information. It's, it seems almost scandalous, this. I think that in each individual case, whether or not the extra time would have changed things will be very individualized. Um, because it may be that actually you freeze your eggs and you go through that process um, and then you start cancer treatment straight away. And it may be that there is something else that has happened. And of course, just the simple passage of time means that you're getting older and fertility is linked to age and the likelihood of IVF working using frozen eggs or frozen embryos is also impacted by age. And I think that the HFEA, the organisation that looks after this kind of thing in the UK, um, will be investigating because there is definitely a gap of knowledge there about why weren't these women told. And Philippa, if I might ask you, just sort of going back a stage um, in a way, this is the NHS we're talking about. This isn't a private fertility clinic that, that we're discussing. And, and as you and, and Nick have been discussing, it's perfectly possible that a lot of these women um, froze their eggs because they knew they were about to have some sort of treatment that might put their fertility in danger. Can you just explain to us what fertility treatment and egg freezing the NHS does and doesn't do? What happens when you get to the point of having the discussion about egg freezing, and there are various different times that that might happen. So it might happen in an already pretty traumatic time. You're going to need to have chemotherapy. You're going to need to have radiotherapy. We're going to delay that 
for, for, for a month or so whilst you consider this. Or it might be happening, um, for example, as you're just getting older and you'd like to freeze your eggs to preserve your fertility. So what happens is, is that we give you medication to suppress your menstrual cycle to, so that we can then take over that and that gives the drugs a better chance of working. And then you have injections of FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, which is a hormone that women produce naturally in the brain that tells their ovaries to produce follicles from which you get eggs. But we give higher doses because we don't just want one or two eggs. We want lots, 12, 14, 15 eggs um, to mature and develop so that we have as many eggs as we can to freeze or to fertilize and freeze our embryos. And during that process, you will have regular scans. And then we give you what's called the trigger shot, which is another hormone called HCG, which helps those eggs mature. And then the process of egg collection is generally done under sedation. And we use the ultrasound guidance and a needle through the vagina into the ovary to collect the eggs. And then at that point, you either freeze the eggs or you fertilize them with sperm, donor sperm or partner sperm. And then you can freeze embryos on day one or on day two or three, or you wait until they're a little more developed on day five to six. So you can freeze at different stages. And at that point, we now have ordinarily more time. Wow. And here the situation is unfortunately, where during the freezing process, something seems to have gone wrong that may affect the quality and the viability of those eggs or embryos when it comes to defrosting them. Uh, Paul Rain, Adrian, it does sound as if that there's a uh, potential for a claim here because the, 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 the service was not as it was advertised. Something went horrendously wrong. What's your view on this, especially given that we know that it's possible that other clinics might have been affected by this dodgy batch of fluid that was sent over from the States? Good afternoon, Nate. Good afternoon, Daisy. Thank you so much. Yes, so to answer your question, potentially there could be a claim. Uh, what we are seeing unfolding, sadly, before our eyes is potential negligence on the part of the company that provided the solution that I understand was used to freeze the eggs, to, to maintain them and to keep them safe during that freezing process. Um, it's quite usual uh, for there to be such claims in terms of any type of, of medical negligence. That, that isn't unusual for us in the, in the legal remit. However, what I did want to touch on was, of course, when we talk about financial compensation, in a case such, like, such as this, it's not really going to meet the needs and the concerns of the patients and the service users. What they wanted, of course, was healthy embryos. And so that sadness, that, that deep loss that they are going to be feeling, and that's mothers and fathers, uh, I think I would be insulting them to suggest that any kind of financial claim would be able to compensate them again. That. Paula, what about the issue of the delay? In, mm. in the world of the law, does that make a difference? Because just looking at the statement from the hospital, they used uh, this freezing agent in the autumn of 2022. They were made aware by the manufacturers that there was an issue with it in March 2023, so six months, five, five months later. It's now nearly March 2024, and this only seems to be coming to light. So we don't know exactly how long they took, but it seems they took many, many months to tell these parents concerned that their embryos might not be viable anymore. And this is what adds, isn't it, Daisy? This is what adds to the pain and suffering. So we have loss, of course, potentially in terms of the embryos, the viable embryos. And now we have pain and suffering in terms of that wait, that long and painful wait until they were told. It can get complicated, though, Daisy, because in this process we need to look at the chain of negligence and who was responsible in terms of that at, at, at each stage in that chain um, and it may well be of course that the NHS I think it's Guy's and St Thomas's and there is a, a, a facility in Sheffield they are going to be saying well look at the time that we were notified uh, about the uh, product we, we did all we could 
to identify the patients who were likely to be affected by this. Uh, that's going to be a key for the patients. You know, when were they notified and did Guy's and St Thomas's, did the Sheffield facility contact them as soon as they possibly yeah. could? I'm, um, I'm going to put my neck course, on the line there and say that that is going to be the absolute crux of the argument, with I suspect yeah. many of these parents saying, no, they were not informed as quickly as possible, and the NHS saying maybe they did do their best. I'm really sorry to say that we've run out of time, but I can... Um, imagine this is going to be a story that we will have to return to more than once on Talk TV. Um, Dr Philippa Kay and Paula Roan, Adrian, thank you very much uh, for setting it out and giving us your opinions. I've learnt a lot this afternoon about fertilisation. Good news you can use. <laughs> Coming up after the break, <laughs> Meghan Markle announces her next big move. My name is Nick Wallace and I'm with Daisy McAndrew sitting in for Vanessa Feltz. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed that if they do no. turn then no. you can be no. in trouble i've got a cockapoo no. if that cockapoo turns on me i win the battle i don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown this concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the you know the corner of the street or whatever i think it's a nonsense <laughs> King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and banged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. up for? This is the plank of the week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names. The New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, mm -hmm. in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as, long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And yeah. that's because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now, that can't be right, mm -hmm. can it? Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Hello and welcome back. Meghan Markle has announced she'll be launching a new podcast with a company called Lemonada Media, who say they're making life suck less one <laughs> podcast at a time. That's a lemon gag, isn't that it? That is a lemon gag. The Duchess of Sussex will also be moving her Archetypes podcast, which was originally produced for a reportedly $20 million deal with Spotify, to Lemonada's platform after Spotify pulled the plug on the partnership with her. Well, joining us from Los Angeles is royal commentator Kinsey Schofield. Kinsey, great to see you. Um, what's the reaction been? What's your reaction to this Lemonada deal? 
I mean, one thing that I haven't said yet is that it is striking that Megan didn't move over to something like Audible or iHeart, which I think would compare to a Spotify. Megan moved over to Lemonada Media. It is a startup launched in 2019. And they only have, at, at the, last time I checked, 50 shows under their umbrella. So it's going to be a much smaller, um, I mean, it's obviously a lot less competition. You're not up against Joe Rogan. Uh, but I feel like it's it might be a, a little bit of a fall from Grace. Um, I've made the argument that I think that she's going to get a lot of hands-on attention and they're probably going to cater to her. And I think she's going to have a lot more control in this arena. However, it does feel like it's not, as it's not as much of a punch to not be with somebody like Spotify or somebody like Netflix. Those are such strong names in the industry. And a lot of us are looking at each other going, what's Lemonada? Like hearing it for the first yeah, time. It's good for Lemonada, um, so, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Now, they I suspect do it's have... not a $20 million deal. Uh, ex exactly. I was trying to hint at that without being too, <laughs> too, too critical. Um, but they do have another great podcast. Sarah Silverman is on this platform, who's a very funny comedian that once uh, suggested that Prince Harry take Meghan Markle's last name. Uh, but also Wiser Than Me with Julia Louis-Dreyfus has had a lot of success. Um, and so those are two celebrity uh those are two celebrity hosts that Lemonada has uh, managed to get as well as Meghan Markle. And, um, you know, I, I think that they clearly have their stuff together to be able to grab names like Sarah Silverman and Julia Louis-Dreyfus. So uh, hopefully this is a success for Meghan. But there were um, a long list of things that went wrong yeah. at Spotify. And Kinsey, I, I thought the press release from Lemonada was quite funny, saying this was the, the CEO um, who's called Ms. Kramer said, uh, Megan's talent as host, creator, and conversationalist is unparalleled. And we are thrilled to co-create a new series with her that fosters her approach to creating art that matters. Now, I think we can all probably say it's not unparalleled, but her archetypes, her archetypes podcast was pretty successful yeah. in quite a few yeah. countries. To be fair. Well, okay, Daisy, I have a question about this, though. If, if if Archetypes was as successful as they claim, why is Spotify that paid Harry and Meghan a significant amount of money to produce 13 episodes in total, including the Christmas special, willing to hand that over to Limonada to do whatever they want with it? I mean, well, is that not a legitimate question? But, if, Kenzie, if, don't, don't you think the answer to that is probably because they said, Megan, who are you going to get for your next series? And she'd kind of plundered all her real A-list names for the first series, maybe had run out of A-list, was going down to B-list. Who and knows? Who knows? Honestly, they wanted, uh, they wanted Harry, too. They yeah. wanted Prince Harry involved. And Prince but Harry... Sadly, they didn't get it. I'm really, really sorry. We're going to have to cut you off, Kinsey, because we're coming to the top okay. of the hour. The news is next. So thank you very much and goodbye <laughs> to Los Angeles. Coming up in the next hour, are influencers the answer to the migrant crisis? The Home Office will pay TikTokers to post urging people not to cross the channel. I'm Daisy McAndrew. This is Nick uh, Wallace, and you're watching Talk TV. Really forgot. <laughs> <laughs>Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. <laughs> King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and bagged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. 
not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. <laughs> Whoa, this is. <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. up for? This is the plank of the week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is, Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it Unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, mm -hmm. in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as, long as it's a long gun, so, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And that's yeah. because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that can't be right, mm -hmm. can it? Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Welcome back to the programme. My name is Nick Wallace. And I'm Daisy McAndrew. We're sitting in for Vanessa Feltz this week, and here's what's coming up this hour. Labour in crisis. Sir Keir Starmer hunts for more attendees of that now infamous Rochdale meeting after two would-be MPs are suspended over attacks on Israel. Plus, violence on our high streets, abuse and attacks on shop workers soar to more than a 1,000 incidents a day. And are influencers the answer to the migrant crisis? The Home Office will pay TikTokers to post urging people not to cross the channel. Plenty still to come over the next hour, but first let's get the news headlines with Alex Barker. Good afternoon. The Bank of England's chief, Andrew Bailey, said he's encouraged by the latest inflation data, which showed the rate stayed level at 4% last month. That's still above the target of 2%, but it might be good news for mortgage holders as it could mean interest rates come down. Mr Bailey told the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee that it's broadly positive news ahead of wider GDP figures expected to be released tomorrow. Whether we, yeah, we will find out whether we had a so-called technical recession or not, depending on what the fourth quarter number is. Uh, you know, in our February March positive report, frankly, it was completely, it was in the balance. We, we didn't have a recession in the forecast, but it's at best flat in the, in the, in the view we took. So, it could, I mean, look, it, it wouldn't take much to tip it either way, frankly. Sir Keir Starmer is under pressure to suspend councillors who failed to call out anti-Semitic remarks made at an event in Rochdale. It comes after a second Labour parliamentary candidate, Graham Jones, was suspended for allegedly saying that UK citizens who volunteer to fight for Israel should be locked up. Labour had already withdrawn support for Azhar Ali in the Rochdale by-election over his alleged controversial remarks. The party says it's committed to rooting out anti-Semitism. However, Stephen Silverman from the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism told Talk TV it's inconceivable that prejudice has been eradicated from the party. How do you go about eradicating it? Well, you can only do it when you become aware of things that people do and say. Um, it stands to reason that there must still be a lot of people within the party at number, all levels who still hold the views that were problematic. They just haven't expressed them. The University of Bristol has lost its bid to overturn a court ruling that it discriminated against a student who took her own life. 20-year-old Natasha Eberhardt died in April 2018. A judge previously ruled that the university had failed to make reasonable adjustments for Natasha, who had chronic anxiety. Today, the High Court upheld the ruling that the university had contributed to her death. Train drivers have announced fresh strikes in March. 
Members of the union ASLEF, who work at LNER and Northern Railway companies, will walk out on Friday the 1st of March over pay and conditions. There will also be an overtime ban from the 29th of February to the 2nd of March. The union says it's fed up with the slow progress of negotiations with rail bosses. A faulty egg freezing product could have affected more than 100 women who had the procedure to preserve their chances of having children. The fertility regulator says two centres, one at Guy's Hospital in London and Jessup Fertility in Sheffield, could have used the product, meaning the eggs might not be usable. The centres say they have contacted all the patients affected. And there was a familiar face on show as Queen Camilla toured some art studios in West London. She admired a portrait of Princess Charlotte, which is the one with the pink background. Meanwhile, her husband, King Charles, is at Sandringham after spending a day in London thought to be for more cancer treatment following the announcement of his diagnosis last week. That's the latest. Time for a look at the weather next with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's been very wet across the UK for Valentine's Day. Only a bit of dry weather has been had across parts of northern mainland Scotland. Shetland and Orkney have seen some showery spells of rain as well. You can see from the earlier satellite and radar picture there's been some pretty hefty downpours too, particularly down towards parts of the southwest. But yet more wet weather is expected to come through into tonight. So tonight, generally quite cloudy. Outbreaks of rain continue to come in from the southwest and spreading northwards across many areas. Some heavy downpours likely throughout the night across southern parts of Scotland. Northern Ireland, Northern England, parts of Wales as well. A bit drier by dawn towards parts of the south. A very mild night, temperatures not really changing from the daytime highs with lows of around 7 to 11 degrees Celsius. And a mild day everywhere for tomorrow. Spells of rain continue to move northwards, mainly across parts of Scotland, Northern Ireland, Northern and Western England and for Wales. Quite a lot of rainfall likely across parts of the southwest that could cause some localised flooding issues. But for central, southern and eastern England, mostly fine and bright. And then going on into Friday, brief ridge of high pressure development so eventually, as that rain clears away eastwards, we'll see somewhat dry conditions, but still some light and patchy rain likely across northern and western areas. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you very much, Naz. Let's move on to our top story this hour. Sir Keir Starmer has found himself at the centre of another anti-Semitism storm after Labour was forced to suspend another would-be MP just 24 hours after it ditched its candidate in the Rochdale by-election. Graham Jones, the prospective Labour MP for Hindburn, was recorded making anti-Israel comments at the same local party meeting as Azza Ali. Israel again, you know. And I'm sure that all these people think that <coughs> when they go home, but you will not get Israel over the line unless we go at them hard. Well, the uncovered recording has sparked questions about who else attended that meeting and why it was that both Graham Jones and Azir Ali were not challenged at the time. And the fallout from the meeting has seen pressure build on Sakir, who promised to tear out anti-Semitism by its roots when he took over the Labour Party back in 2020. Joining us now to chew over all of this in the studio is Talk TV's chief political commentator, Peter Cardwell, also joined by Scarlett Maguire, pollster at JL Partners, and journalist and political commentator, Mike Buckley. Mike, let's start with you. How much impact is this having in political circles? The polls are staying exactly where they were, so I don't. This doesn't seem to be only having any impact yet in terms of public opinion. Really, is there a new Santana one so, uh, that shows that it? There is on a Savannah poll. Well, Savannah. I was reading about this earlier on. So there've been four polls come out in the last couple of days. Two of them have shown an increasing Labour lead. One of them, I think, is down a couple of points. The Savannah one is down seven points. But bear in mind, the last Savannah poll was up about seven points on its previous one. Okay. So their poll rating seems to be all over the place. So all taken together there's no change in public opinion as yet. But, of course, that could change depending how this story develops in the future. Well, Scarlett, you are our pollster. Is, <laughs> is, is he right? Nothing to see, there's no problem here, it's not really having an impact? Yes, it's not necessarily there's nothing to see, it's just that we wouldn't see it yet anyway if there was something to see. So um, you're quite right, it's actually too soon to tell. Um, if there is any fallout, we'll see it over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'm not sure the polls have been very stubborn when it comes to Labour's lead. They've been sort of consistently 20 points ahead. I'm not sure if this is what 
sort of undoes them. But I do think it hurts Keir Starmer's personal ratings. And, and Scarlett, just, just before, on that issue of the polls being stubborn with the Labour lead, that they are stubborn on paper, then other people saying that if you dig a little deeper, they're a bit soft. In other words, yes, people are saying, I'll probably vote Labour, but are they really committed when push comes to shove? Is that going to turn into X's on ballot papers. Yeah, so we've been dealing with this all year, really, because Labour have had this massive lead, but every time you talk to a voter, they don't seem to be very enthusiastic about Keir Starmer, even the ones that say they're definitely going to vote for him at the election. Uh, we don't quite know how that's going to transpire. It could be that there's lower turnout. The one thing I would say, though, is that the Labour polling looks actually a lot less soft than the Conservatives. So uh, people who are voting Labour seem to be a lot more sure, at least they're telling pollsters they're a lot more sure that that's definitely what they're going to do on the election day. That's not quite the same for the Conservatives, and the Conservatives are only holding on to half their vote anyway. Peter, for someone like me who's been watching the left of the Labour Party for some time, it's not surprising that they lapse into anti-Semitism when their guard is down and they think no one's listening. And I imagine that now there are going to be journalists all over uh, the social feeds of all the candidates who might be uh, put forward by Labour in, in, in the forthcoming election. Do you think that there is more meat to be found uh, here? Or do you think this is just a very odd, isolated incident? Very unfortunate that a Labour candidate was spouting anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, but we're not going to get much more of this as we head towards the general election. Well, the problem is that anti-Semitism remains a big problem in the Labour Party, perhaps a small number of people, perhaps in the fringes, perhaps in individual constituencies. But the fact is that this was not just two people saying things. This was a whole room of Labour activists, and there doesn't appear to be anybody who stood up and said, hold on a second, why are you saying this? Why are you saying this hateful bile? And that's a problem for Keir Starmer. I don't think anybody would begrudge the fact that... Because I yes. mean, we've all been in environments where we, we haven't necessarily had the courage to call out someone for saying offensive Well, things. walk out then. I mean, there didn't seem to be anybody who was challenging this at all. Well, yeah, the assumption is that everyone was nodding along. But again, it's not a surprise well, to, we, we, to many of us. No, no, it's not. And also the fact that, I mean, look, Keir Starmer has brought the Labour Party on leaps and bounds. He's made it electable, as we've seen from the polls. He's certainly, uh, they've won a number of by-elections. I expect they'll win tomorrow's two by-elections, uh, despite what's going on at the moment. W there, there is a lot that he has done in terms of anti-Semitism as well, and he should be given praise for that. But the fact is, there is still a minority of people within the Labour Party on the left who are saying this kind of stuff. And you're not going to eradicate that unless you have very, very strict procedures in place. And of course, even when it came to the fact that it was uh, Azhar Ali was there, he was allowed to get away with this, even OK, only for 24 hours. But there have been other Labour candidates who aren't quite as chummy with Keir, Keir Starmer, MPs like Keir Osmore, for example, who've said similar hateful, horrible things and lost the whip basically immediately. And uh, Scarlett, when we talk about this issue, I, you know, I suspect, well, in fact, I'm, I'm pretty certain that the five of us think that uh, it's a big deal to have a prospective parliamentary candidate who's clearly anti-Semitic. Does the country, does the voting public believe that anti-Semitism is a big issue? I think it depends. It became a big problem for Jeremy Corbyn's brand, especially in the run-up to 2019, and then actually the public did care, and you did hear them saying, um, you know, knocking on doorsteps, talking to people in focus groups, people really did care, and they thought it was incredibly problematic. Now, that's also because of, I think, the inferred stance on um, sort of uh, how they thought he would be on, um, the, you know, the international stage and foreign relations. Um, I do think this matters for Keir Starmer, though, even if people don't care much about anti-Semitism as, you know, someone might think they would. In that, it plays into pre-existing worries that I think voters have about him, which is that he is weak and that he doesn't necessarily stand for anything. And I think the problem is that indecision over the Rochdale candidate sort of speaks to that exactly, much like the 28 billion did as well. Yeah. And I think that's where it could be more dangerous for them. And, and Mike, the slight flip side of that is that we've seen a lot of uh, either prospective candidates from the Labour Party or Labour MPs really struggling with um, their own consciences when it comes to two-state solution, mm. when it comes to Gaza, and those that have, you know, a, a lot of Muslim voters. That's another problem that the, the Labour Party's got, which actually the Conservative Party doesn't really have. And but people are legitimately angry about what's happening in Gaza. They are, and completely understandably. We're dealing with a very complicated situation where obviously the attacks on October the 7th were horrific and you know, it was almost unconscionable to imagine anybody supporting that. And yet, what's happened since is also horrific. We're looking at 30,000 people, about half of them children, dead now in Gaza. It's perfectly reasonable to think that Israel has a right to defend itself, but also to think that they've gone and are continuing to go too far. So communicating that primarily is the job of, of Keir Starmer, his shadow foreign secretary, David Lammy. But of course, individual candidates and MPs are going to be asked that. 
not all of them have got a background in international relations or understand Middle Eastern politics. And that's completely understandable, reasonable. So I think there needs to be a gauge between somebody said something a bit silly because they didn't really understand the situation and somebody clearly is anti-Semitic and has a problem. Then the Labour Party needs to act, and this week they have. But Scarlett, how significant is the Muslim vote? And when I say the Muslim vote, I do understand that this is not what you know one group of people who will all vote for one party or, or who will vote for a, for an MP who they agree with on Middle Eastern politics. But generally speaking, uh, you know, does the Muslim vote vote? You know, do they come out more to vote you know, than other demographics? How significant are they in certain constituencies? I mean, overall, they're still not significant in terms of numbers, so they're a very small minority. Um, on the national picture, uh, it won't make much difference at all. Um, I do think, though, uh, individual Labour MPs are worried about their seats, and when you go to individual constituencies, you can see why. I'm not sure whether we will see any of them lose, but I think particularly where if you take a seat like Bristol, it's actually going to be a new constituency, but the current Labour MP for Bristol, Greens did very, very well there last time, and I think potentially a mix of the Greens doing even better, capitalising on perhaps some of the um, uh, crossness about uh, Labour's green agenda, which they've now gone back on, and the Israel, um, sort of uh, Palestine, Gaza conflict. I think you can maybe see something happening there. Mike, you don't seem concerned that this will affect the Labour vote in, in the long term. Are you, are you thinking that Keir Starmer is cruising gracefully towards a general election victory because the Conservatives keep querying their own pitch and, and making it difficult for themselves? Or do you have concerns? Uh, not uh, particularly. I mean, I think this... I have grave concerns over this. This needs to be dealt with. Anybody who is anti-Semitic in the Labour Party, they need to be found, they need to be rooted out. Shut the door and as Peter said earlier on, Keir Starmer's done a huge amount of work in this since he became leader. The evidence of that is the, the very good and close relationship now between him and the Labour Party and the Jewish community and leaders in the Jewish community. So that is a good thing. In terms of the picture moving forward, most people in Britain are going to vote on something other than this. Mm. And if you look at the polling, Labour's consistently 20 points ahead. But the other two key indicators are that Keir Starmer may not be universally popular, but he's a lot more popular than Rishi Sunak, which is all he needs to be. And also, if you look at the polling on economic competence, most people have got much more faith in the Labour Party running the economy than the Conservative Party. And that plus leader racing are the two key indicators other than the headline poll. Peter. Yes, I think Mike makes some very, very good points there. There was a little bit of good neutral news, I suppose, for Rishi Sunak, not bad news today, that inflation's at 4% and is held there. We'll see tomorrow whether Britain's in a technical recession. He's bet the farm, really, on the economic stuff. And as Mike and Scarlett correctly point out, these issues are not... Anti-Semitic anti-Semitism is not the issue people mostly vote on. It'll be cost of living, it'll be the NHS. And obviously, whenever these issues come up that make life very awkward for one party leader, the other party leaders, uh, Conservatives, all the smaller parties, will try to you know, make as much hay with it as possible. And, and Scarlett already mentioned the Green Party, but what about the other smaller parties, either from the left or the right, mm -hmm. that are trying to chip away at the, the Labour vote and the Tory vote? Well, in Rochelle, I think it's very interesting because George Galloway yeah. is standing in that constituency for the Workers' Party of Britain. There are actually three former Labour MPs, well, two former Labour MPs and one former candidate for Labour who are standing. So Zazarelli, George Galloway and Simon Janchuk is standing for reform as well. I think uh, George Galloway, that will be a real worry to the uh, Labour Party, but I don't think they're going to lose there. But certainly for the smaller parties, there is an opportunity here. There are uh, constituency boundary changes right across the country. And there are, uh, certainly the reform at UK is doing pretty well, 12, 30% in some polls. Scarlett, could Galloway win Rochdale? He could, he could, but it's such a sort of um, unique... We're now in such a unique situation with that constituency that um, I, mean, I don't think it's likely he could. If he did, obviously it would be significant that George Galloway would be back uh, in Parliament for the sake of it, but I don't think you can read anything sort of wider into that. And, and widening this out, Scarlett, in terms of um, a whisper that I heard uh, earlier today, is it possible that the Conservatives might try and capitalise on this either storm in a teacup or very damaging episode for Labour, whichever way you want to look at it, and maybe call an election in May. What are the polls telling you about the public's appetite for something like that? Well, I mean, actually, the, the, the public kind of want the election over and done with. I don't think they're <laughs> clamouring for it, but a lot of people in their heads actually have already kind of moved on, and this is Rishi Sunak's problem, is that no matter how much trouble Labour get themselves into and whatever difficulties Keir Starmer might be handling, they're still no longer listening to the Conservatives. And in so the their... dial isn't shifting? 
Not particularly, no. Oh, I, mean, I think it's because the public have just said we're done. And, and that's what you really get from focus groups in particular. But that's also, I think, why the polls aren't moving, is because they're done. And if even if they're done and they're still not feeling like Labour, they might stay at home, they might vote reform, they might do all sorts of things. But it's quite hard to find someone who's very enthusiastic about voting Conservative. Gosh, I spoke to a senior Conservative MP who made a very similar point on an anecdotal level. And she said when she was campaigning in the local elections a, a year and a half ago, she said, I felt like being in the middle of a divorce. People were really angry. We hate the fact that you've done this, this, and this. And then campaigning last May in local elections, she said, it felt as if the divorce was over. There was no hatred, there was no bitterness, but it was just it's like, done. I'm just over, Your time's I'm just up. over. Yeah. that's it, How, it's gone, yeah. it's over, so, I've so, moved on. So what does Rishi Sunak have to do? No, I think I. Nothing he can do. I, I kind of think the writing's on the wall, and I think it probably. <laughs> here we go. No, no, but I do think it happens. Hey, someone, we and called I think, it here first on Vanessa no, on Talk TV. <laughs> but I think some indication of that is the autumn statement, for example. So you know that they are betting a lot on the economy getting better, on potentially tax cuts, all the rest of it. The autumn statement they gave away, you know, two percent national insurance didn't do anything. Nothing they've done since September has moved yeah. the dial at all. Yeah, it's too budget. little, too late. It's too, for it's a lot too late of, for a lot of voters. Exactly, and so I think there are two big ifs for them. The economy, you know, we might might be in a recession on Thursday. It might not be getting better. People People certainly don't necessarily feel like it's getting a huge amount better, especially because more people are coming off onto higher mortgages than, than they were before, actually, just because of the lag of this sort of thing. And if they do, they probably won't give them the credit for it anyway. And let's talk a little bit about the date of the election, as, as Nick was saying. So, um, Peter, last time you and I chatted uh, on air about the date of the election, you were saying November the 14th, I think, was your you know, hot bet on that. Of course, that does clash with the American uh, election. Yeah, so there was a thought they might move it back to October. So there was a thought in the Sunday papers, I think, that it, mm. that it might move back. Um, we'll we'll um, go down the <laughs> line. Mike, what's, if you were a betting man, I don't know if you are a betting man. Well, if I was a betting man, I would say November or later. But in, I think the truth is that nobody really knows. I do know that in some government departments, they've been cancelling big meetings scheduled for April. So my guess is that Rishi Sunak wants the polls to move. He wants to do it in May, get it over with, still be prime minister. However, the polls ain't going to move. The last time they moved significantly was when Liz Truss was prime minister. So I think it's going to be later in the year. Well, later than November, because again, some some in the last week were saying October, maybe going from November to October, and some were saying pushing into Christmas. I mean, it could go to January. I mean, the last two prime ministers we had who knew they were going to lose, Brown and John Major, they both pushed it right to they the end. Clung. We could be looking at January next year. But my, my guess would be November the 14th. Well, that that, that has, is the hot date. Rishi Sunak has said on the record it will be this year. Yes, um, obviously, he can change his mind. But I, I think Mike's right. I think it will be uh, October, November time. But certainly. everyone but moaned about a Christmas election last time. It worked out OK. Everyone seemed to get on with it. And well, it depends turning. on your perspective. If you're, you're <laughs> you went, you went out that. knocking on doors. <laughs> oh, well, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Especially <laughs> the activists don't like being doing it in the thick of winter when they're trying it's to prepare. It's not ideal, I can tell you. No. Although the Scarlett, I, need to, I need to know if Scarlett's a betting woman. Oh, right. I'm not a betting woman. Um, but but uh, I, the only thing I would say is we're running out of time for it to be called in May anyway. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that decision would have to be done in sort of two or three weeks. So I'm um, actually hopefully we'll be put out of our misery soon uh, but, and we'll know whether we can book holidays and stuff. But um, I, I, my guess is later in the year too. We've got the budget as well on the 6th of March. So I, I, I imagine they'll assess what, if any, pull bump they've got, they get from that and then make a decision. I don't know if there'll be enough time, though, to yeah. read in. I don't know, but no, anyway, I think they, the I, think one, but I, like... I agree it's too late for me. I yeah. guess unless they were going on private polling. In fact, Scott, I wanted to ask you, we hear an awful lot about, particularly at this time of the electoral cycle, about you know, part of Labour Party or Conservative Party doing private mm. polling. Do they... I mean, obviously, they will ask the question they want the answer to, but does private polling differ in any way to the type of polling that you do? No, not necessarily. I mean, it depends what they're doing. Um, I suspect they'll uh, both Labour and Conservatives will be doing uh, a mix of sort of polling, polling, surveying, uh, modelling, so um, trying to sort of use that data to extrapolate and work out things on a more um, sort of, like, uh, local level and more granular detail, and then also focus groups. Um, I don't know, because the, <laughs> it, sometimes you look at them and you think, well, they can't be doing polling, because otherwise they wouldn't be doing that, but I'm sure they are all doing it. The only difference is if you have um, a private poll uh, that's not going into public domain, you don't have to publish any of it. If you have uh, a poll where even a little bit is going to public domain, you have to publish all of it, the tables, the questions, everything. Right. I mean, we've been talking about this for, for an awful long time, but the idea of the tail wagging the dog has always annoyed me so much when it comes to creating policies. As in, you get, you know, you get a bunch of politicians who get together and say, let's do a focus group and ask, you know, Mrs Miggins and Daisy and Nick what they would really like to see. And then let's Let's give them that, rather than sitting down and saying, what are the problems that the country actually has and what policies can we come mm. up with? I know maybe I'm sounding ridiculous, Poly <laughs> Pollyanna and optimistic. And what, you know, what are the solutions, maybe even long-term solutions, that might take you know, eight or ten years to really make a difference? And you just think, 
that would be refreshing, rather than, oh, we did a, we, we did a focus group. But you well, don't get any credit think, for that. No, no, but I think that's absolutely right. And actually, I think people misunderstand how to use polling because the, it's best used when it's all sort of finding out what people's problems are. And then I think you go away and think about what you're going to do about them. Then you can message test, see how that might land, see if you need to change some of your messaging. But in terms of the actual policy solutions, I think that should be driven from them. Um, I do think part of the problem with Labour recently, especially over the 28 billion stuff, was they were actually looking a bit too much like they were being led by focus groups. And this mm. is something voters, in fact, you quite often hear it in a focus group, which is quite discombobulating. <laughs> But, you know, voters say, oh, you know, all politicians are just focus grouping things these days, and you sort of sit there and you think, mm. But um, <laughs> it is, uh, yeah, but I think people people can pick up on when things don't sound authentic and genuine. Uh, and that, that's the word, isn't it? It's, it's people know when they're being fed a lie, mm. and they know that you're just being told something. It's like, you know, when, you, when your boyfriend says, yes, you look lovely, and you know you don't. The economy's you know turned when the corner, you're, darling. <laughs> you, know, exactly, you know when but, you're but being fed a lie. that's never happened to you, Dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I might have given away too, like, too much. Um, guys, thank you so much. That was a really, really... Really, really appreciated. Really appreciated. And I think there will be a lot of people going down the bookies uh, to bet on the result after hearing what you've had to say. <laughs> really do appreciate it. Peter Cardwell, Scarlett Maguire and Mike Buckley. For a full list of the candidates in the Rochdale by-election, you can head to our website, talk.tv. Coming up after the break, the Home Office is going to extreme measures to try and curb channel crossings. Find out what they'll be doing next. Yeah, we'll be discussing that. I'm Daisy McAndrew, this is Nick Wallace, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. <laughs> King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and bagged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, is it? It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. Why are you well, doing okay. that for? This is plank of the week, <laughs> Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is, Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the new conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, mm -hmm. in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as, long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And that's yeah. because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now, that can't be right, mm -hmm. can it? Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back. Now, the Home Office is planning to hire influencers and celebrities to post messages on TikTok urging migrants not to cross the channel in small boats in what looks like a rather desperate bid to curb illegal migration. Social media stars in countries that account for a large amount of illegal migration to the UK will be offered thousands of pounds to promote new immigration laws, including the threat of deportation to Rwanda. Now, the government believes TikTok is a vital platform to target migrants after it was revealed that people smugglers are using it to promote their work. Joining us now to discuss this is Matt Dathan, the Home Affairs Editor at The Times, who got this exclusive story. Uh, congratulations on, on digging this one up, Matt. I mean, what was your reaction when you first heard it? I thought it was uh, an early April Fool's, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I couldn't quite believe that we'd be paying uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, to celebrities to post messages on the Home Office's behalf, but that's exactly what they're planning to do, at least. But isn't this where the, the eyeballs are, and therefore you've got to... Uh, pay money to the people who can influence those eyeballs. Yeah, that's the Home Office's argument, that uh, the people smugglers have been so successful on advertising these trips on the likes of TikTok and other social media channels uh, that you've got to beat them at the same game on the same channels, uh, and particularly on TikTok, because the government has a ban on the use of TikTok, so it can't uh, advertise directly uh, on the platform uh, like it does on social media like uh, tic uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, in Albania, France and Bulga uh, Bulgaria, Belgium, for example, you've had Home Office adverts warning migrants that if they come to the UK, they will face deportation to Rwanda. Matt, I can, I can sort of see that if you are you know, a young person, you know, quite desperate, wants to th take your chances on a boat, that maybe you would be influenced by you know, what a TikToker or so, you know, social media influencer uh, might tell you. But is there any evidence that that sort of messaging might make a real tangible difference. And, and which countries are you, you just mentioned? But Albania, we're led to believe th that we're sort of on track for cutting the numbers significantly coming over from Albania. So which are the main countries that we're talking about? The Home Office has tried to target the countries that account for the largest numbers of migrants crossing in small boats. Uh, but the problem is, as you say, they're slightly a step behind the, the latest numbers. Albania. Uh, made up 13,000 of the crossings in 2022. But last year, the, this, this was down to about 1,300. Um, so they've kind of um, uh, identified Albanian uh, influencers who they will try and target. Uh, they haven't actually approached them yet. Uh, but uh, the reality is that uh, actually last year, in 2023, there were very few TikTok adverts on uh, advertising these, these routes. Um, so the Home Office is also targeting uh, Iraq, Egypt. Uh, they're also targeting Vietnam and India and Turkey and trying to find influencers who can spread the message not to come to the UK uh, if you're an economic migrant. Uh, uh, and Matt, this is obviously taxpayers' money that's going to be spent here. How will they know it will have the right impact and how will they mm. audit its effect? That's, that's a very good question. And the question that actually MPs uh, and us journalists have been asking the Home Office ever since they started and announced the Rwanda policy, there's been no... Uh, I guess, uh, hard evidence to suggest it's going to deliver value for money. In fact, the opposite, the Permanent Secretary at the Home Office had to admit that uh, the Home Office does not uh, worked out a, a value for money assessment um, because there is no evidence to assess this on. The response from the government would say this is a novel approach, this, this has never been tried before, this kind of Rwanda policy, and the same goes with paying influencers to stop, to trying to stop migrants making a journey in the first place. And um, what sort of money are we talking about that these influencers are getting? And, and how many, you know, what, what might the whole budget for the influencer uh, bill be? For uh, Albanian uh, influencers, and uh, the Albania sort of plan is the most advanced, they're capping the payments at £5,000 per influencer. Um, and uh, I think they've got a budget uh, earmarked of about 30000 So you're talking about six. Six influencers there, I think, for Albania. Um, but the problem is, we, we've revealed a story from a, from a leak, a, a, a document that's been leaked, before the Home Office has even been able to approach those individual influencers who they've identified as potential targets. And uh, several of them have come out today and said they have no interest in uh, po posting messages on behalf of the Home Office. Well, um, one of them, Fabio Daja, said that... Uh, his TikTok account is all about social phenomenons and it's not about politics or anything else. And he just posts random thoughts about day-to-day uh, -day life. So he has no interest 
in posting messages warning migrants from his um, country not to make the journey to the UK. I, I was going to say, as far as I'm aware, the reason that influencers have influence very often is because they're cool. You know, I don't, don't want to sound like an old fogey using a word like that, but, you know, they have influence, particularly over young people. Now, there's nothing less cool than saying, I bring you this almost this party p political broadcast on behalf of the Conservative Party and the Conservative government. You can just see it's not really going to sit with their brand image. It, it also makes me wonder who who's shilling for other governments, which influences over here ended up yeah. uh, being might be being paid by other governments to spread a, a particular message to the nation's youth through TikTok. I mean, is is this revolutionary what the British government say they're up to, Matt, or, or is this just sort of par for the course by governments around the world? Well, I've not come across governments paying um, influencers to spread messages on immigration, but it's certainly <laughs> a phenomenon that happens on other issues. Uh, for example, one of the uh, influencers that have been identified, Ben Washburn. He's an American travel blogger uh, who fell in love with Albania and posts lots of messages about his time in Albania. Um, well, he's he's done paid advertisements or paid posts. I don't know what you call it, marketing posts for uh, for for the I think visit Albania uh, tourist board, for example. Uh, so it's 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 done in other sort of environments, but I haven't come across it in terms of the immigration environment. Um, I mean, they're not very happy that they've been named. Um, they've, 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 because they haven't been approached by the Home Office uh, yet. Uh, but I guess um, you can't have it both ways if you're an influencer. If you're happy to put your life uh, on TikTok, which can be accessed by anyone in the world, uh, then it, you know, if you're going to be named in newspaper articles as uh, potential targets, then I, can't, I don't think you've got too much to complain about. Yeah, well, I can... I, I mean, you've certainly done your job by naming them, your job as a journalist, but I can understand they'll be absolutely spitting feathers about the fact that they've been named mm. as potentially being of interest, uh, you know, to a Conservative government in that way. But actually, you were just saying, Matt, that uh, TikTok is available to use by everyone in the world. That's not quite right, because it's not available, as you said a bit earlier on, um, to government workers. Just remind us what the deal is, what the issue is with TikTok and the government and civil servants. Well, the, the ban was introduced uh, last May, I think it was, um, the cross-government ban on use of TikTok uh, because of the security concerns around the uh, the, the, the fact that the, the company was founded by a Chinese company and, and the suspicion or that the, there are there is some evidence that suggests that uh, the Chinese state um, has some influence, owed some access to the data that's gathered by TikTok, which is denied by the company. Uh, but that's why it was banned by uh, but by the UK government and also other governments across the world as well. So, yeah, I'm, I'm wrong in saying that it's, it can be accessed by anyone in the world, but it can be accessed in, in most countries, at least. By most children. Uh, Matt, just finally, I suppose in the round, this speaks to the government's desperation to try and stop these boats coming over. They are willing to chuck as much at the wall as possible in order to see what sticks. I mean, do you, do you have any hope that this might work or even come to fruition now that you've exposed what's going on? Well, it's part of the wider advertising campaign that the Home Office has uh, planned uh, to roll out alongside the uh, implementation of the Rwanda policy. I think there's a realisation in the Home Office and, and wider government that you can't just start flights to Rwanda and expect it to uh, create a deterrent uh, effect to stop further migrants coming across yeah. without those potential migrants knowing of the consequences they'll face. It's a bit like telling a, a criminal uh, that they do not a criminal not knowing that they'll face prison if they commit certain crimes. So I think there's a, a, a massive part of the Rwanda policy is the messaging around it. And so I think we will definitely see a, a massive advertising campaign, but whether they go ahead with paying influences following the backlash uh, from our story is another matter. I'm not sure they will. Um, I, I think I can go further than that, Matt, and say that I think you, Matt Dathan, have killed off that policy very <laughs> successfully by, by yeah. highlighting it and publishing it in The Times. So uh, uh, maybe you've saved the government from an embarrassing uh, series of refusals from all these TikTokers, but uh, yes, I think we can all see that that policy is going absolutely nowhere. So congratulations again on your scoop, Matt. Thanks well done, for Matt. talking to us. Thank you. All right, now coming up after the break, over a 1,000 incidents of violence and abuse against shop staff were recorded every single day last year. My name is Nick Wallace. This is Daisy McAndrew. We're sitting in for Vanessa this week. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker.
if it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. <laughs> King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and bagged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry gonna sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. up for? This is the Plank of the Week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is, Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it Unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, mm -hmm. in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as, long as it's a long gun, so, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And that's yeah. because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that can't be right, mm -hmm. can it? Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. There were 1,300 incidents of violence and abuse against shop workers every single day last year. Well, the British Retail Consortium has criticised the woefully inadequate action taken by the government to address the crisis, which saw attacks on staff soar by 50% in the year to September. Joining us now is Archas Patel, who owns a shop in Oxford, and Fiona Malone, who owns a shop in South West Wales. I suspect that these horrible statistics that Nick and I are both shocked uh, about probably don't come as much of a surprise to either of you. Um, Fiona, tell us no. your experience of what it's like facing up to these sorts of threats. Um, from my point of view, we, we've been really lucky. We haven't experienced a huge amount of violence. I did have an issue where I'd confronted someone that had stolen something and he pulled my hair. Um, luckily, I shouted really loud at him because I'm quite feisty being a ginger person. And he um, he then backed off. Um, but from that, it kind of did make me feel quite vulnerable. And I wanted to make sure that we covered our members of staff because I don't want them feeling vulnerable like I felt. And Varchas, you have your shop in, I think, Horsepath, which is a rather leafy part of Oxfordshire. Have you experienced violence or seen violence against uh, your family in your shop? Yes, um, I mean, I can think of two uh, examples. Um, on one occasion, uh, there was an arson, to, a arson attack uh, within the first year of us buying the shop here in Horsebath, Oxfordshire. Um, that individual did not let mum and dad and uh, he, he, he was a, he was 
somewhat terrorizing us at the time. Um, and he and he was convicted of arson. The second example, unfortunately, is not very nice. Um, there was our local lad who was re stealing repeatedly. And on the last occasion, my father actually told him, look, please stop stealing. Um, this isn't good. Uh, he, he, he actually punched dad in the face. Goodness me. I mean, it's extraordinary that, that you are so vulnerable because you are so public facing. And with these figures, which seem to suggest that there's been an extraordinary rise of it. I think, I don't know what your assessment of it is, whether it is linked to organised gangs deciding just basically to loot uh, shops. And we've, I've seen video footage of that happening and it, and it must be terrifying. Or whether people are just getting so desperate, they're just nicking stuff for themselves. I mean, Fiona, what, what's your experience of having to tackle the issue of shoplifting? Um, I mean, our experience, we're, because of where we are, we haven't really had the organised gangs of crime, but we have had a noticeable rise. Um, and one of the things that we've done is to try and we, we're using some AI technology called X Hoppers, where we actually have a headset on each member of staff and it actually looks at our CCTV cameras. And if we see anything suspicious, it notifies my telephone with a little video clip of it. So then I can take action as soon as I possibly can to make sure that we minimise any losses that we have in the shop and obviously avoid violence. That sounds incredibly yeah. futuristic. Sorry, just explain that again. Every member of staff is wearing a headset linked to yeah. store cams. Yeah, so we've got, we don't have body cams, but we have um, 28 CCTV cameras and they're oh, actually Lord. linked to um, an AI technology called X-Hoppers. And what it does, if you go to put something in your pocket, if you pick something off the shelf really quickly and put it in a bag, it will then notify myself and the other managers and then we will actually go we can look at the cctv see if it's a real incident and obviously then decide what to do from there and and fiona actually that last um sort of slightly throwaway phrase that you said there um seems to me from a lot of the shopkeepers i've spoken to and shop owners and then decide what to do from there that, that's the crux of the problem because very often you know absolutely what's going on in your own store you can see that somebody's stealing or repeatedly stealing shoplifting the trouble is that, you know, Chris Philp, a minister, just recently urged shopkeepers to tackle the shoplifters. Well, mm -hmm. as you found out, having your hair pulled, and that could have been a lot more serious, tackling a shoplifter, particularly in you know, some of the sort of big urban areas when you know, there's a lot of drugs, a lot of deprivation, yes. people can be not in their right minds. Tackling a shoplifter can be incredibly dangerous. We've, we've got a, you know, a knife crime pandemic. So... It's easy to say, you know, like, you've got the CCTV, you've got the technology, you can mm -hmm. present it all to the police, but the police are either not coming out to these calls when shops call them and then not really doing anything about it and telling shopkeepers to sort of deal with it themselves. Yeah, yeah. And obviously we would say to each member of staff, please don't tackle. However, if myself or my husband were there, then obviously we would then make that decision because from our point of view we want to promote our shop as being safe for all of our customers um, and actually what we've noticed is that with the AI technology for example we used to have quite a lot of um, youngsters shoplifting from us but they've now all become aware of what's happening in our shop and therefore they they come in but they make sure that they don't actually take anything. Barchas, what anti-theft measures have you put in place in your shop? Um, literally, there's nothing. We are in the process of actually getting CCTV. Um, but even with CCTV, if 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 somebody has the intention or a group of people have the intention to walk to to walk into our shop um, and commit theft, I can't see mum and dad standing up to them. You know, especially dad with his. Uh, physical disabilities and and mum elderly, I might be able to stand up to them. But you know, if there's about four or five of them, what can you actually do? Do, do you get any support from the police or or from politicians in in terms of not just helping you make your premises more secure, but in terms of responsiveness when something does go wrong, so that you are able to feel safe and feel like you've got control and can protect your stock? 
there aren't, in my view, there aren't that many safeguards for uh, uh, shopkeepers. Um, I think there should be more. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I did read somewhere that um, shoplifting could potentially be classed as organized crime, but I could be wrong there. Um, um, you know, shopkeepers throughout, throughout the country do um, a very, very essential job for the, for their local communities and even in a, in high-density uh, high areas. And I genuinely believe there should be more safeguards in place to uh, to uh, protect them because at the end of the day, they are just trying to make a living for themselves. Uh, they don't earn tens of pounds on every transaction. In fact, on, so on some products, it's literally pennies. Um, and I feel some of them are continuously let down throughout the country. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, Varchessa. And not only are shopkeepers not very wealthy and, and, and don't have uh, the ability to very often defend themselves, being let down by the police, but they actually are giving their local communities a really invaluable service, particularly in the more rural and, and remote areas. And, and if you're going to be putting your livelihood and your lives at stake mm. by being on the front line... That's, that's the that, thing, isn't it? You know, you're in danger of being attacked. Yeah, it's just not tenable. But thank you so much. And, and obviously, please, um, Varchas and Fiona, uh, stay safe and and keep up the good work in um, foiling those shoplifters. All right, well, coming up after the break. It's Valentine's Day, in case you hadn't noticed. These scientists <laughs> have identified what love does to our body and our minds. My name is Nick Wallace. This is Daisy McAndrew. We're sitting in for Vanessa. And you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. <laughs> King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and banged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry gonna sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way, couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. up for? This is the plank of the week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> The problem is, Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had, and so yeah. they would have been better off calling it UnpopCon. Really. <laughs> um, Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, <laughs> in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as, long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And that's yeah. because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now, that can't be right, can yeah. it? Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
welcome back and happy Valentine's Day. Now, the band Foreigner once said, I want to know what love oh, is. Oh, I thought you were going to sing that I line. know you did. I know you did, but you don't want to hear my singing. <laughs> but that is the very question that's now been answered by some love-struck boffins. Scientists have identified dopamine as the main driver of love. It sends messages to the brain to give feelings of pleasure, satisfaction and motivation for a particular person. This acting alongside the feelings of lust creates attachment, which, when put together, supposedly creates the wonderful, all-encompassing feeling of L-O-V-E. Well, joining us live is the science editor at The Times, Tom Whipple. There we go, Tom. We've got a formula for love at last. Do you believe it? <laughs> it's, I mean, yes. It, it, the thing is, you know, everything that goes on in our brains is to some extent electrical or chemical. Um, love is a very complex thing. It's a solution to a particularly thorny biological problem. Um, if we were turtles, it would be easy. We would just have one thing. We would have sex, and then the males would go one way, the females would go other and lay some eggs. The problem with humans is we've got to have the sex, we've got to have the attraction to the partner, and then because children are so annoying and so <laughs> difficult to bring up and they hang around for so long, we've got to have a way of staying with our partner, which is a fundamentally weird thing to do. Two of two humans with, with largely different goals, different personalities, you have to come together and stay together. So yes, of course, the brain evolution has come up with a form of biological bribery to trick us into doing this quite silly thing. OK, so staying together is silly, according to Tom Whipple. I'm not sure you're quite on message with the whole Valentine's Day thing, Tom. Well, look, we are all largely, you know, biological machines with the purpose of... We're hijacked by our own DNA for the DNA's ends, which is to reproduce itself. And we're simply these automata that are acting at its behest. And we can write a whole bunch of poetry about these things, but it's, you know, it's testosterone, estrogen, dopamine, vasopressin, oxytocin, doing their things, and their purpose is Tom, to mindlessly you, reproduce... You what, what, what a soppy old romantic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tom Whipple, thank you so much for uh, bringing us right down to earth with your recipe for love. Talking of which... Look who's in the studio. I know. What it's, a couple. It's the, love, up. <laughs> it's the love doctors themselves. As ever. Jay and Ian. Exactly. That's what the whole show is about tonight. Is it bro bromance? Bromances. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Actually, yeah, we are holding on a little too long there. It, right? it would be nice to... It was a little too Got long. Got a bit awkward, it was, didn't it? It was on a linger. It was a linger, I think it was. <laughs> uh, we are going to talk about what happened outside Oliver Tobias's house, which was just absolutely yes. outrageous that people could gather in such numbers, uh, almost without any interference, and just carry on intimidating. We'll talk about that. That. And also, close to your heart, women who swear too much, Daisy. I bloody love it. Oh, <laughs> good I think I think I'm allowed to say that. I just won't. I just won't turn the air any bluer than that. Um, join us for the talk. It's coming up at six o'clock. We'll be back soon. Take care. Good okay. night. Have a good. Bye. -bye. See you same time tomorrow. <laughs>
a woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and bagged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry gonna sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What do you do? I'll just